Born in 1952, James Lee, also known as Lee Jong King, completed a BA in history at Yale in 1974 and a PhD in history from the University of Chicago in 1983. For 20 years, he taught in the sociology department at Caltech before moving first to the University of Michigan and more recently to Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where he is chair of history and sociology. Wang Feng, born in 1967, earned a BA in economics from Hebei University in China before completing his PhD in sociology at the University of Michigan in the late 1980s. He pursued postdoctoral fellowships at Berkeley and the East-West Center in Hawaii and joined the sociology faculty at UC Irvine in 1996. He served as chair of the department at Irvine from 2007 to 2010. This article, co-authored after Wang settled at Irvine and while Lee was still at nearby Caltech, shares a common goal with the article by McNichol. These Chinese scholars wish to fill in a part of the map of world population that was more of a blank for Malthus than was the familiar terrain of Europe. They argue that Malthus's view of population dynamics in historical China suffered from his lack of information, so they try to correct what they see as his misunderstandings of the situation. Malthus traveled extensively in northern Europe, from Scandinavia to Russia and through other neighboring countries. These travels helped to expand his perspectives on variations in patterns of family life that affect the timing and extent of marriage and childbearing. However, Malthus never got anywhere near a trip to China during his lifetime. Anything that he had to say about China came indirectly from travel narratives and other accounts that he was able to read. While Europeans knew something about China two centuries ago, this information was rarely up to modern standards of empirical reliability and accuracy. Malthus did what Europeans often did in those days, whenever they looked out into the world beyond their own small nation states. He resolved the world into what these Chinese scholars call a binary contrast, an us versus them picture in which you first describe something about yourself or your own culture, and then you describe the rest of the world as the opposite of whatever you noticed about yourself. In the case of Malthus, this us versus them contrast of opposites involved which kinds of checks to population operated in different cultures. The article first summarizes Malthus's picture of the world to show exactly which features of that picture Lee and Wang object to and wish to correct. They start by reviewing his picture of England and by extension Northwestern Europe in general. Since we know that Parson Malthus did not approve of artificial contraceptives or abortion or other similar ways to regulate births, we easily recognize their description of a European pattern of no birth control within marriage. Certainly in terms of what was viewed as acceptable and proper, this is an accurate picture of Malthus's ideas. It may not be a complete picture of what Europeans were actually doing in everyday life, Certainly some people were getting abortions for unwanted pregnancies hundreds of years ago, just as they do in most parts of the world today, whether Reverend Malthus approved of them or not. But in general, there probably was not a lot of fertility control within marriage in England or any other European country in the late 1700s. So how did Europeans exercise a preventive check on the birth rate? Li and Wang also faithfully present this side of Malthus's thinking. Delayed marriage was the cornerstone of what he regarded as acceptable moral restraint. In his first 1798 essay, Malthus describes such delays in marriage timing as careful choices made by responsible individuals, thinking rationally about the best interests of their future family and children. In fact, as Li and Wang point out in this article, the late marriage pattern may actually have been an important feature of traditional culture in Northwestern Europe, not something people had to reason out individually in the lonely isolation of their personal lives. Delayed marriages often may not have been all that carefully thought out for a lot of people. They may have married late in life simply because other problems, like not being able to obtain some land of your own and not being able to get married until you own your own farm, may have forced them into such delays. Some scholars have suggested that the practice of primogeniture, in which the oldest son inherits all the land in the family, and the other children must go and do something else with their lives, 
forced most people to marry later than they would have if everybody had inherited equal shares of an estate. Only a culture with this primogenitor rule would recognize the characters in the nursery story of Puss in Boots. An old widow's oldest son gets the whole farm. The second son gets a fine draft horse and goes off to do contract work for people who own their own farms. The youngest son gets a pair of boots, meaning he has to take off on the road, an empty sack, symbolizing what he actually inherits from his family, and a cat, which represents the wits by which he will have to make his way in the world. Fortunately, he got a good cat, who takes the boots and the sack and eventually turns them into a whole kingdom for this pathetic youngest son. But every farm child living under the system of primogenitor would recognize themselves in that story, either as the preferred eldest son, or perhaps as the youngest son who had to live by his wits, and who probably married much later as a result. It certainly is interesting to notice that countries where the demographic transition first got started generally followed this rule of impartable inheritance that all goes to the eldest son, and that it took about a century for the demographic transition to shift from northwestern to southeastern Europe, where the principle of equal testation of shares to all the children was the common rule. At any rate, Malthus most certainly described his own society in his own time in terms that made delayed marriage an acceptable preventive check to population but that rejected interference with conceptions after people got married. When he set about comparing his own England to the far corners of the world, the us-versus-them contrast that he chose involved the matter of the timing of marriages. In China, Malthus told us in his essay, women nearly all get married very early. This removes any possibility of delayed marriage as a preventive check. Since he rejected contraceptive technologies to limit conception after marriage, he seems to have assumed that people in China also exercised no control over fertility after marriage. This means, of course, that Malthus sees China as lacking any kind of preventive checks at all. The only logical conclusion he can make in that case is that in China only positive checks must be left to check the growth of population. In his essay, he points out that, quote, the lower classes of people are in the habit of living up almost upon the smallest possible quantity of food. A nation in this state must necessarily be subject to famines." Unquote. Li and Wang comb through many other passages in the writings of Malthus and very effectively document the way that he created the image of two polar types for Europe and China. Europe with its preventive check based on moral restraint and delayed marriage, and China without any kind of preventive check forced into the misery of famine and pestilence and the vice of wars and the exposure and killing of infants who could not be supported. In other words, ruled by positive checks. Obviously, this for Malthus would make China uncivilized and morally inferior to Europe. Equally obviously, two representatives of a Chinese culture that regards itself as the oldest, most refined, and most advanced culture on the planet cannot be satisfied with this judgment from Malthus. They want to show us where Malthus went wrong in his views on China from two centuries ago, and in the process perhaps even lift up China from the ranks of the uncivilized parts of the world and place it, at the very least, on a par with England. When Li and Wang review evidence from contemporary research in historical demography, they reach the conclusion that at least some of the guesswork by Malthus about life in China still appears essentially accurate today. Malthus was right, they agree, that women in China married very early. This actually is not anything unusual or unique to China. Many, or even perhaps most traditional cultures around the world, structured the transition between childhood and adult social roles and statuses, and chief among these roles were that of wife and mother. The Jewish ceremonies of bar mitzvah for boys and bal mitzvah for girls provide public rituals that grant young people adult status in the community, and it is no accident that these rituals are timed to coincide approximately with the ages of puberty. The message in culture after culture is very clear. As soon as you are biologically capable of reproducing, we want you to get married and get busy at it. In this respect, China was no different from most other traditional cultures in other parts of the world. 
there was at least one noticeable exception to this cultural ratification of puberty and the reproductive obligations of adult members of society. And Malthus lived right in the middle of it. As we have seen in England and in Northwestern Europe more generally, both men and women tended to marry later in life. Whether this was a deeply embedded cultural pattern, driven by systems of land tenure, patterns of household co-residence, and other social forces, or the result of some kind of rational moral restraint caused by a desire to gain or to protect one's social status, the result was plain to see. Li and Wang show us this result in their figure 5, charting the share of all women who still had never married at different ages. The line in this chart for England around 1800 shows that at age 25, about half of all English women still had never married. Even by age 30, about one-third of all English women remained unmarried, a fact of which Malthus surely approved. If we look northward to Scandinavian countries like Sweden, Norway, and Denmark around 1800, delayed marriage was even more pronounced. At age 25, nearly two-thirds of all women were still single. The median age at marriage, when about half of them were still single and the other half had married, appears to have been between 27 and 30 years of age. Even by age 45, when the childbearing ages were pretty much in the past for most women, between 10 and 20 percent of all women in northwestern Europe still had never gotten married at all. It doesn't really look like Malthus needed to preach at people in his part of the world about delayed marriage. They already were practicing what he preached in large numbers. The contrast between this part of Europe and the Chinese early marriage pattern appears sharply in this figure 5. Even in their early 20s, fully 90% of all women in Liaoning already were married. By age 25, the share still single was only in the single digits, and by the time women were in their 30s, marriage was virtually universal. So Malthus had it right that China married early and England married late. But this is only half of the picture of preventive checks to the power of population. The crucial point for Li and Wang is that Malthus simply assumed that Chinese women of 1800 would never interfere with births after they got married any more than English women of those days would have done. These authors present recent research evidence that they believe shows Malthus to be wrong on this point. They suggest that even two centuries ago, China practiced fertility control within marriage as a preventive check to population. When we turn to their figure six, we find the high birth rates in European countries that Malthus would expect. It is vital to keep in mind that these are marital birth rates that is, births divided by the number of married women only in the denominator. We already know that lots of women in these countries were not married at the younger ages, but among the women who did get married, birth rates were very high. A rate of 500 births per thousand married women at age 20, for example, means that each year about half of all women at that age were giving birth. Another way to look at this is to say that a woman could expect to have a birth about every other year. Even by age 35, it looks like European women were having babies on average every third year or so, since a third of all women were having babies in any given year. This pattern sometimes has been called natural fertility, meaning that people don't appear to be doing anything to control or regulate the chances of conception and birth. In contrast, in three different sites around China, in Japan and on the island of Taiwan two centuries or more ago, Births to married women only seem to have happened about half as often as seen in Europe. In Anhui province, for example, there seems to have been only about 200 births per thousand married women, or one birth every five years. The rates actually got a little higher between ages 20 and 25, but by age 25 it still only looks like there were about 250 births per thousand women, or about one birth to a typical woman every four years. These women did not make up for a slow start with higher birth rates at older ages, either. These low rates in early adulthood then decline even lower at mature childbearing ages, so that there is always a big gap between birth rates in East Asia that are far below the rates from Europe. Malthus undoubtedly would have been astonished if he had been able to inspect this chart. 
the low marital birth rates for women in East Asia, even at the prime childbearing ages, appeared to provide ironclad evidence that China had a preventive check to population. Chinese women of his day may all have gotten married at young ages, but after they got married, they had babies far less often than did women in England at that time. This certainly implies that something was happening in China to slow down the uncontrolled or natural pace of fertility, that they were controlling fertility within marriage. In the final part of the lecture, we will explore what Li and Wang can find to say about exactly what was going on in Chinese marriages to produce this alternative preventive check to the power of population. Thinking about those young Chinese and Japanese wives of 200 years ago, it might be hard to imagine at first how they could end up with only half the risk of having a baby in any given year compared to the equivalent risk experienced by young wives in northwestern Europe. In the England of Malthus, for example, once you got married, all bets were off. Couples with a healthy sex life could expect to have one child after another in fairly quick sequence for many years. Only biological factors like lactational amenorrhea, when menstrual cycles and ovulation sometimes don't start up again right away while a mother is still nursing a previous birth, might have slowed the process down. What was going on in China? Li and Wang actually turned this article into a whole book on this subject, published in 1999 as One Quarter of Humanity. In that book, they go into more detail about all kinds of possible influences on marital fertility in China. For one thing, they point out that while Chinese women did experience nearly universal early marriage, just as Malthus suggested, this was not at all true for men. Chinese men typically married much later, if at all. A big age gap separated older husbands from their younger wives. Without going into too much detail about the decline in sexual libido with age among men, we might just say that a young woman with an older husband probably was less likely to get pregnant than a young woman with a younger husband. That could be at least a small part of the explanation. The authors also mention the fact that some women in China were plural wives. In cases where one husband has several wives, it is well established from demographic research around the world that the chance of conception and birth is lower per wife in these households than if each wife had a whole husband all to herself who could get her pregnant. However, this can only be a tiny part of the explanation of low marital fertility in China, because even in societies that practice polygyny, the requirements for men to support more than one wife usually are so high that in practice only a few percent in the single digits of all men can ever attain such a situation. Another possibility raised by Li and Wang is that there just may have been less sex going on for Chinese couples than in England. We have heard the Italian Botero tell us that men are as apt for generation now as they ever have been, and certainly human sexual appetite does seem to be a pretty powerful biological locomotive. But we must not forget that we as biological organisms always grow up and live in a matrix of social forces that shape us and our behavior. Li and Wang point out, for one thing, that in China, young women married for love, but it was love of their parents rather than romantic attachment to a boyfriend. Marriages were arranged between families. While women might marry very young, they often did not know their husbands well at all. It might even have taken a year or two or three for the couple actually to consummate the marriage and start having sex. After the birth of a child, nursing could go on for a year or even two, possibly reducing the risk of subsequent conceptions even if the couple did resume their intimate relations. And those relations may not have been as intimate as often as they were in European societies. It does appear from some of the records cited in the article that births started later after marriages and were spaced farther apart in China. Chinese women also may have known of some natural contraceptives, such as plant products that could act as spermicides or otherwise interfere with the process of conception. And Li and Wang even mention that every major philosophy dominant in China in recent centuries has shared the same peculiar and strong ideas about how too frequent sex for men can rob them of strength and even threaten their health. 
This idea that Westerners like Picasso would have found very amusing might have had some small effect on birth rates in China. These influences on conception should not be confused, however, with some other kinds of birth control for which there is much better evidence in China even two centuries ago. Women in a Chinese village in Malthus's day would have laughed at a young wife who didn't know how to use folk methods to abort an unwanted pregnancy and would call her a foolish wife. The Japanese word for induced abortion is the same word used to describe the thinning of blossoms on the cherry tree in order to produce larger, better fruit at harvest time. Depending on your personal opinions about induced abortion, you may consider this practice as another form of contraception, or you may count it, as Malthus undoubtedly would, as a positive rather than a preventive check. Certainly the practice of infanticide, exposing or drowning or burying unwanted infants after their birth, is a positive rather than a preventive check. The trouble in this case is that we are not quite sure how abortion and infanticide are being counted in the research studies that produced those low estimates of marital fertility from 200 years ago in China. After all, there was no modern system of vital registration of births set up anywhere in the world back then. The data on which the figures in this article are based came from retrospective reconstruction of people's lives from lineage histories, that is, from the Chinese equivalent of family trees, listing many successive generations of parents and children. We don't know for sure who gets counted in such retrospective histories, and more importantly, who doesn't get counted. If a Chinese woman had a son who grew up to become a father later on himself, certainly he would be recorded as a birth to that woman in the family's lineage chart. But what if she had a baby, and then the baby was taken out and drowned? Would that birth be counted and recorded to her credit in the family history? Would it be included in calculating age-specific fertility rates to show in the chart in the article? Li and Wang don't go into sufficient detail about the rules and practices governing these lists for us to know whether infanticide was invisible in them or not. Certainly induced abortion would be invisible to them and would be included here as one of the means of marital fertility control being practiced in Chinese families two centuries ago. With this new perspective gained from historical demographic research in China, we certainly can get a new perspective on the comparative paths taken by Europe and China toward preventive checks to population, and we have to rethink some of the conclusions and judgments of Malthus. While historical Europe apparently did have one possible preventive check to population in the form of delayed marriage, it looks as though China had the other possible preventive check to population in the form of fertility control within marriage. Each culture had one of these preventive checks, but lacked the other one. England and China give us complementary pictures of the ways that human societies can cope with the pressure of population on resources. Today, of course, both Europe and China are fully engaged in both kinds of preventive checks. In both culture areas, people marry later than ever in life. In both culture areas, couples are using all kinds of alternatives to avoid pregnancies within their marriage. With both preventive checks in action, would Malthus say that these populations are more civilized than ever? Or would he still be holding on to his argument that only delayed marriage is a truly moral response and all the rest of it is some kind of vice? It is certainly something to think about, even if we can't ask him ourselves.